So now we'll talk about calculating the standard change in free energy. So the standard change in free energy uh, symbolized um, here delta G for the reaction, but with the degree here indicating it's standard. That's the criterion for spontaneity under standard conditions. Standard conditions being, uh, well, standard. Um, there's three methods that we can use to calculate this. Um, we can find the standard change in enthalpy and the standard change in entropy. We've learned how to do both of those. Um, and those would be from heats of formation and um, standard entropies. And then we can use this reaction. Um, it's not a reaction. That equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, to calculate the standard change in free energy. So that's one way. We can also calculate it directly from uh, free energy of formation values that we would look up in a table. Or we can calculate it from free energy changes for the individual steps in a stepwise reaction, provided we know the free energy change for those steps. So we'll look at each of these methods. So the first one, um, using the equation delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Yeah. So we calculate um, delta S, the standard change in entropy, the standard change in enthalpy from tabulated values. And both of those take the same form. We just learned about the standard change in entropy. It's the entropy of the products, and that is a um, joule per mole Kelvin um, because the amount of entropy depends on the amount of substance. And so each of those is multiplied by the coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. We add all of that for the products. And then we subtract the same sum for the reactants. And then we can plug um, that value with delta H into this equation. Um, strictly speaking, this is only valid at 25 degrees because uh, these calculations are done under standard conditions. Um, but we can use this as an estimate for other temperatures. So we can plug in other temperatures here. It's not going to be uh, real accurate, but it'll give us a ballpark idea. So let's do an example. Uh, consider the oxidation of NO to NO2. So here's our, our chemical equation. Calculate the standard free energy change at 25 degrees Celsius. Determine whether the reaction is spontaneous at this temperature. So we're going to do this method um, where we use the equation. So we need to find delta H for the reaction and delta S for the reaction. So we need to calculate um, delta H for the reaction. So let's do that one first. So the standard heat of reaction is going to be equal to um, the heat of formation for NO2. So we're going to look that up in Appendix 2B. And for NO2, where is it? The value is 33.2 kilojoules per mole. So 33.2 kilojoules per mole. That's the heat of formation for NO2. We have one mole of that, right? So that's going to be multiplied by one mole and the moles cancel out. So those are the products. And then we're going to subtract the heats of formation for the reactants. You have a question? Um, well, thank you. I do have it all on my table now. Um, so for NO, right, we can look that one up. It's 91.3. And we have one mole of that. 91.3 kilojoules per mole. 
and so we're subtracting the heats of formation for all the products. What's the heat of formation for O2 gas? Zero. That is an element in its most stable form. So whether it's one half O2 or five O2, doesn't matter. So we don't need the brackets there then. Get rid of them. The moles cancel out. And so delta H is going to be 33.2 minus 91.3. Helps if you start with a blank screen instead of other numbers. Minus 58.1 kilojoules. And that is for the molar amounts in the balanced equation. So that's something we learned how to do back in Chem 1A. Any questions about that? You just have to go look the values up. If I make you do something like this on a test, I'll either, you know, cherry pick the values and give them to you in a nice little tiny table, or I'll give you the giant table and make you look through all the stuff and find them. You don't memorize these things. So delta H, we also need delta S. And that's the one we learned how to do on Tuesday. So again, we're going to take the standard entropy for the products. So we, we've got NO2 right here. And in this table, it lists um, delta HF, delta GF, and S, standard S. So for S, it's 240.1. So we have one mole of that, 240.1, and the units are joules per mole Kelvin. It's important to write down the units because this one, delta H is in kilojoules and S is in joules and we don't want to forget to take that into account. So the products and then we're going to subtract standard S entropy for the reactants. So for no, it's 210.8. So we've got one mole of no, 210.8 joules per mole Kelvin. Is standard entropy for oxygen zero? No, it isn't. What is zero entropy? Do you remember? Zero Kelvin and a perfect crystal. A perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero entropy. So we don't get the shortcut for calculating the standard entropy change of a reaction of being able to just discount all the elemental uh, reactants and products. So we do have to consider this. So the number of moles is one half and fractions can be confusing in math equations. So let's just go with 0.5. 0.5 moles, and then we need to look up S for O2, and that's um, 205.2 joules per mole Kelvin. The moles cancel out. So I put big brackets over here because we're subtracting the sum of all the entropies for the reactants. Um, and those negative signs can get us into trouble. And we can find enough trouble of our own without adding that. So 240.1 minus the quantity 210.8 plus 0.5 times 205.2. I'm getting minus 73.3. Anybody else get that? Okay. Minus 73.3. What are the units on that? Joules per Kelvin. So we're going to put these values into this equation so we can calculate the standard free energy change. Um, I'm going to go up here. So delta G 
is going to equal the uh, heat of reaction minus 58.1 kilojoules minus the temperature which would be 298 Kelvin well this is just not working out very well let's do this let's get rid of that pretty stripe there we got minus 58.1 kilojoules and we're going to subtract uh, the temperature is 25 so 298 Kelvin times um, delta S minus 73.3 joules over Kelvin. So we've got joules and we've got kilojoules, right? I think the, the simplest thing is to just, huh, yeah, that's what happens when you erase, oh, never mind. Um, Instead of kilo, put in times 10 to the 3. Convert that to joules, just kind of sneaky there. So negative 58.1 times 10 to the 3rd minus 298 times negative 73.3. So minus 36256.6. Kelvin's cancel, that's going to be joules. Which would be a better unit, joules or kilojoules? Kilojoules. So convert that to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000. Um, and so we end up with delta G being negative 36.3. Yes, kilojoules. There we go. Minus 36.3 kilojoules. Any questions about how I got that? Yeah. So then, uh, basically, when we're calculating uh, our change in enthalpy and our change in entropy, uh, the Heat of formation values will be given in the uh, standard entropies. Mm -hmm. So then it's just a matter of uh, keeping an eye on the moles. Yeah, it's a matter of just watching the details. Um, and I, I'm using the unit mole in here just to emphasize you know, in the table, these are given as kilojoules per mole. Now, if I was just writing this out for my own purposes, I, I would probably leave out the one, and I'd leave out moles, and I'd just write this, this many kilojoules minus that many kilojoules. But like down here, you really have to remember, you have to put in any, any coefficients. Those multiply that term. And so you don't want to forget those. And then you got to watch the you know, kilojoules and joules and all the negative signs. It's just little annoying details. Is this reaction spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius? Yeah. Because the change in free energy is negative. So this is spontaneous. Any other questions? Um, estimating blah, blah, blah. Estimating standard free energy change at a temperature other than 25. So for that same reaction, calculate the value of the standard free energy change at, 50, at negative 55 degrees Celsius. Is that more spontaneous or less spontaneous? At the lower temperature. Whoops. Well, delta G 
equals delta H minus T delta S. So we calculated these numbers and I typed them in there so we don't have to try to remember them. So we've got again that minus 58.1 kilojoules minus now this temperature 273 minus 55 218 218 Kelvin 218 Kelvin times that negative 73.3 joules per Kelvin So I'm just going to change that to joules again. Negative 58.1 times 10 to the third minus 218 times negative 73.3. So this is minus 42120.6. Change that back to kel uh, kilojoules minus 42.1 kilojoules. Any questions? Yeah, we're still using the first method. What's, what's different about this one is that we're looking at a temperature other than standard temperature. So the new delta G, and this is, this would be more of an estimate. Um, I wouldn't want to, you know, bet research money on that. Um, but it gives us an idea, is it going to be more spontaneous or less spontaneous at minus 55? More spontaneous, because it's more negative. Okay. What do you think would happen if we went to positive 55 degrees Celsius? Probably get less spontaneous. It may even cease to be spontaneous. Okay. Okay, another method, calculating delta G using tabulated values of free energies of formation. So we just calculated the uh, heat of reaction from heats of formation and we did the uh, change in entropy from standard entropies. We can calculate the, f the free energy of the reaction in the same way. It's the free energy of formation for the products times their coefficients and then you subtract for the reactants. So free energy of formation, we haven't looked at that before. That's the change in free energy when you make one mole of a compound in its standard state from the constituent elements also in their standard states. So the free energy formation of a pure element is zero. So that's the same as the enthalpy. We're, we're calling all of the elements, their standard states, zero. So let's do an example here. Um, this is one of the reactions that occurs inside the catal catalytic converter in your car. Um, we've got the simultaneous oxidation of carbon monoxide and the reduction of nitrogen monoxide um, to form carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And both of these are normal components of air, so they're not really considered pollutants at all. Use standard free energies of formation to find the standard free energy change for this reaction at 25 degrees Celsius. Is it spontaneous at standard conditions? So delta G for this, we are going to take uh, the products and find their free energy of formation. So here's CO2. We look up CO2, it's minus 
kilojoules per mole. No, not one mole, two moles. Got two moles of that times minus 394.4 kilojoules per mole. And we have nitrogen, zero. And this table's really kind. It actually, we look it up and it, it shows it's zero. It doesn't just leave it out. So that one's fine. So we've got our products and we're going to subtract the reactants. Here we've got two compounds and so we do have two things here. We have two moles of carbon monoxide and so we look that up in this little table and it's minus 137.2 kilojoules per mole. Ran out of room and I've got two times And O, 87.6 kilojoules per mole. And so we write it all out and then we do it in the calculator. Two times negative 394.4 minus the quantity two times negative 137.2 plus two times 87.6, close the parentheses, equals, I'm getting minus 689.6 kilojoules. Anybody else get that? Either we're correct or we both made the same error. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, if you use more parentheses, it's, it's probably um, going to be just fine. Yeah. If you use too few parentheses, then you could be in trouble. Could you do this without any parentheses? Yeah, you could, but you have to think a little more. And those negative signs, I don't know, they're just really devious. Mess you up, right? probably just typed in one of the digits not quite right. So is it spontaneous? Yeah, it is, because delta G is negative. And delta G is the best predictor of spontaneity. Any questions? So what would be asked if something is from our, what we uh, determine, like, is it spontaneous, is it non-spontaneous? We won't have to say, like, how spontaneous it is? No, you, you, I wouldn't ask you to say, well, this is very spontaneous or it's a little bit spontaneous. Because it, it, it really is kind of odd to say, well, this is more spontaneous. It's so sort it's of like, on the like one woman is more pregnant than another woman. It's like, well, I mean, you're pregnant or you're not pregnant, right? There is not really, I mean, You've been pregnant longer, but does that make you more pregnant? I don't know. Right? So the third method, calculating delta G from, um, for a stepwise reaction. Well, I guess maybe let's, let's just say something about this one. Um, what is less useful, perhaps, about this method than the other method? You can't compare different temperatures. I mean, you could, but then you have to go and you have to calculate delta H and, del and delta S anyway, whereas with the first one, you have those values. And so if you want to look at a different temperature, you can just plug the new temperature in there and compare them more easily. But if you have the delta G values available, this is probably going to be faster than doing it the other way. So they're, you know, would be better in different situations. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, sorry. So free energy is a state function. 
And so we can do the same thing with the free energy that we did with enthalpy. Using Hess's law, where we say if you can express a chemical reaction in terms of a series of different reactions, then the overall energy changes are going to be the same. So um, you can go back to chapter six if you need a review on this. Um, but here's a summary of what we need to do to delta G when we mess around with the chemical equation. If if the chemical equation is multiplied by a factor, then you multiply delta G by the same factor. If you reverse the direction of the chemical equation, you reverse the sign, you change the sign on delta G. And if the chemical equation can be expressed as a series of steps, then delta G for the overall reaction is the same as adding up delta G's for each step. So this method will work if you have a series of equations that you can add together. If you don't have that, then you better use one of the first two methods. So find delta G for this reaction. We've got N2O plus NO2 gives us three no's. Um, use the following reactions with known uh, standard change in free energy of reaction values. This is delta G. So we've got three chemical equations here. And what we need to do is figure out how to add these equations to get this equation. And so this is something where you could have multiple different processes end up with the correct final answer. My personal strategy is I, I like to look at, okay, what's in the reactants, what's in the products, and how do I need to switch these around? Here, NO is a reactant in this equation. It's a product over here. NO2 is a product here and a reactant there. So I'm going to need to write this one backwards. I'm going to need to reverse that first equation. So I'm going to write it backwards down here, uh, 2 NO2. Um, these are all gases. Sometimes you have to be careful with those, um, with those states because you'll have equations involving state changes. Here I don't, and so I'm just going to skip writing them as I do this. NO2 going to 2 NO plus O2. And so delta G for that is going to be the same there, but I'm going to change the sign. 71.2 kilojoules. And then we're going to look at this guy, this next reaction. Um, NO shows up in this overall reaction. It's one of the products. And so I'm going to use this one in the forward direction just as written. And it's helpful if you line up the reaction arrows. It's a little less confusing that way. So N2 plus O2 gives me two no, and that's positive 175.2 kilojoules. So I see that, you know, things are kind of looking up here. This O2 would cancel out with that O2, um, but I still need to get rid of this N2, and I'm missing the N2O. So that's where this third one comes in. If I put this one in, as written, I'm going to end up with things on the correct side of the reaction arrow. So 2N2O, and that's going to make N2 plus O2, and delta G is minus 207.4. OK, let's look at what we've got here. Um, I want just one N2O on the left. Here I've got two of them. So how do I get one? Divide by two or multiply by one half. So I'm going to take this bottom reaction and I'm going to multiply by one half. 
So if I do that, then I have to multiply delta g by 1 half. So that's going to give me coefficients of 1 half on those guys and a coefficient of 1 on the N2O. I multiplied everything by 1 half. So this one now matches up with that compound in this equation. And then NO2, again, I've got two of them, and I only want one. So I'm going to multiply this one by 1 half as well. So 2 times 1 half is 1, 2 times 1 half is 1, and this becomes 1 half. Everybody okay with that? Now let's look at what we've got here in terms of NO. I'm supposed to have three on the right side. I've got two here and one there. And so that's all good. So I should be okay. Let's add this together and see what ends up. It's not looking very good. So I've got the O2 here and I've got O2's over there. I think there's, I think I maybe have a coefficient wrong in an equation. Yeah, when I typed this in, I left something out. Is this third equation balanced? No, it isn't. What would balance it? A 2 in front of N2. There's supposed to be a 2 there. If that's a 2, then this is, is just 1. Phew, because we need that so that N2 and N2 cancel out. And then we've got N2O plus NO2 forming 3NO. So delta G for that, we're going to take the delta G's for each of these reactions. So I've got 71.2 um, times 0.5 plus 175.2 plus negative 207.4 times a half. So I end up with 107.1 kilojoules. What's different about the state well, the, the only reason you would need to be careful about state changes is you might have an equation where it's, you've got, well, let's not use nitrogen, where you've got liquid water being transformed into water in the gas state. That involves energy, right? And so in your mess of equations here, you're going to have liquid water and gaseous water, and you can't cancel liquid water with gaseous water. And so then you'd need to write the states and make sure that you've got all those correct. Since all of these are in the gas and there's no sneaky things like that, I just left them out. Any other questions? Yes? So in the uh, new reaction that you wrote, the uh, one-half oxygen canceled out with the oxygen. Yeah, I had one-half one here and yeah. one-half here. Uh -huh. one. So that's one, and yeah. I've got one over there. OK, and then we were really able to eliminate that one oxygen because it was a reactant that was used up. So in this step, I would generate half a mole of oxygen. And this step, I'd generate half a mole of oxygen. And this step would uh, use one mole of oxygen. Okay. They're not necessarily in order okay. of occurrence. And if you can write the steps, it doesn't matter if you could actually do that or not. It's just, can you describe it that way with measured delta Gs? Then you can figure out what the overall change is. Any other questions?
So here's a good question. Why is free energy free? And when we think of free, we think of no cost, right? Somebody just hands it to you. We often want to use the energy from chemical reactions to do work. We want, um, we burn the gasoline in the engine to do work which causes the car to move forward, right? The change in free energy of a chemical reaction represents the maximum amount of energy that is available or free to do work. Not all of the energy generated by the reaction is available for work. Free energy measures the amount that is available or free to do work. Bless you. So for many reactions, the change in free energy is less than the change in the enthalpy. So we, you know, we looked at exothermic reactions and okay, the heat of reaction is this. Not all of that energy can be used to do work. So if we look at this, um, carbon as graphite reacting with hydrogen to form methane. So the heat of reaction there is minus 74.6 kilojoules. But not all of that energy can be used to do work. Only 50.5 kilojoules can be used to do work. The remaining 24.1 kilojoules are lost to the surroundings as heat. Any questions? If we think about that equation we've been using, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So here's our delta H, delta H minus 74.6. Um, but there's that change in entropy involved. How is change in entropy related to heat being lost to the surroundings? When the surroundings absorb heat, does that raise their entropy or lower their entropy, the surroundings? It raises the entropy of the surroundings. Okay. So this term with the entropy change is where the heat goes. So that term by itself would be what we lose to the surroundings? This is the minimum amount of heat that would be lost to the surroundings. Okay. And this is the max delta H, um, delta G is the maximum available to do work that isn't lost as heat, which is the increase in entropy. Just want to make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. So the, the change in free energy represents a theoretical limit. It's the maximum amount of energy available to do work. In a real reaction, the amount of energy to do work is less than delta G because energy is also lost to the surroundings in addition to the entropy part. So only reversible reactions can reach the theoretical limits. We talked about reversible reactions earlier in this chapter. A reversible reaction is going to occur infinitesimally slow. It's going to be extremely slow. And what happens then is the free energy is drawn out in infinitely small increments that are going to exactly match the amount of energy produced by the reaction. So here's an example of a reversible process. So we have a cylinder here um, with a movable shelf sort of thing here, right? And there's sand on top and there's a gas trapped underneath. This is not sliding all the way down because the gas is exerting a pressure that's holding up the sand. But the more sand you put on it, the farther down it'll sink because it's a force compressing the gas. If you take sand off, the shelf will rise up. So a reversible process would be where you take off 
one grain of sand at a time. And you're not even going to notice the change here. So incrementally removing the sand, it comes up, and you're not going to lose extra energy to heat. It's a reversible process. Well, what about real reactions? All real reactions are irreversible by that definition. So we're not going to obtain that theoretical limit of available free energy. Let's look at the example of a battery. So a battery has energy stored as chemical potential energy and will release that energy in the form of electric current. So we connect the battery, we close the circuit, electricity begins to flow, electrons flow through the wire, but there's resistance in the wire. And so that generates heat. So some of that energy that was there, that was available to do work, is lost to heat. So we do, we do all the work, and then the amount of energy needed to recharge the battery is going to be more than the quantity of work that was done. So every time the battery puts out and is recharged, we're losing energy to heat. Does that make sense? So in any real cyclical process, battery charging and discharging, the system may return to its original state, but the surroundings don't. There's a permanent dispersal of energy into the surroundings. There's a permanent positive change in entropy for the universe. If you have a chemical reaction with a positive free energy change, that's non-spontaneous, right? You can force it to happen by putting energy into it. And in that case, delta G represents the minimum amount of energy required to make that process go. In practical terms, you're probably going to have to expend more energy than that. Making a, a real non-spontaneous reaction occur always requires more energy than that theoretical limit. That makes sense?